we're going to move on from being able to find the slopes of polar functions, and we're going to start taking a look at areas of polar functions. Now, to do so, we have to derive the formula first. Um, and what we're going to do instead of using rectangles in Cartesian coordinates, so you probably remember if we had a curve, which we called f of x, then what we might do is we might try to sub partition this into rectangles that would be able to approximate the area under the curve. All right, and then we would just find the area of those rectangles. But in polar coordinates, we have a different way of thinking. So we can't use this notation or this idea. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a polar wedge as illustrated in the diagram below. And suppose that we wanna to try to approximate the area bound by a curve from an interval from a to B for theta, all right? Um, and what we could do is we could partition that into these things called polar wedges, all right? So, and we wanna find the area of one of these wedges. Actually, we wanna find the area of each of these wedges, okay? So we're gonna call this a polar wedge. And to be able to figure out what the area of a polar wedge is, that would be a subsection, the distance from A to B, so this is its own angle, which we're going to call like theta sub i. So this could be like this angle right here could be like theta sub one, and this angle could be theta sub two, and this angle could be theta sub three, all right? And so to be able to find the area of one of those polar wedges, we would just take that angle divided by two pi, because that would be the proportion of the entire revolution around the, X, or around the, um, the circle or around the pole, if you would, and we would just multiply that by pi r squared, okay, which is our formula for a circle. And so the distance the radius is going to be contingent upon what the angle theta is. Okay? So ultimately, we would just get this formula because the pi's would cancel out, and we would end up with this is the area of one of those wedges. Okay? And of course, we would have different radii, and we would have different angles based on what the angle was. Now, of course, the whole, the whole um, impetus for this is to be able to break it up into an infinite number of polar wedges, theoretically, okay? So as we get more and more of these wedges, we get closer and closer to the actual value. And so that's where we're gonna introduce a Riemann sum, all right? So ultimately we'd like for theta to approach zero, that means that the number of wedges would approach infinity. And so we can write this Riemann sum the limit as n approaches infinity, i equals one to n of one half r sub i squared delta theta sub i squared, right? So that would be basically the change from a, so from here to here would be like a delta or a theta sub i, and then from here to here would be another theta sub i. And of course we'd like theta sub i to approach zero eventually, all right? So now remember that we got this from the polar wedge formula. Okay, so this is all just the wedge formula. And of course, we'd like to be able to turn that into an integral because of Riemann sum, we know we can write it as an integral. And so we end up finally with the equation that our area is going to be one half the integral from A to B, either F at theta squared D theta, or we know that F at theta is the same thing as R, so we can just substitute this back in for R, okay? All right, so let's take a look at an example of how we would go through and try to use this formula um, along with some other things that we might know about polar coordinates. So um, let's sketch each of the curves and the area that's asked, and then we're gonna compute that area. So we have one leaf of the equation R equals two cos three theta. So first things first, let's plot that area. All right, so I'm gonna go into my food plot and we have three cos of two theta, right? Um, I'm sorry, two cos of three theta, went backwards on that one. And we end up with a diagram that looks like this, okay? So it's a rose curve. Um, and so if I were to sketch this on my Cartesian or on my polar plane, okay? I get this, and then I would get this as best as I can, okay? Not really that good at drawing these, but... And so we're looking for the area of one leaf. And so what I would do is I would consider this leaf, the one that's going to cross 
on our x-axis. And moreover, what I would do is I would use symmetry because we could just figure out the top part right here. Okay, so I'm just taking this and I'm just um, blowing it up. And then what we could do is we could double that because it is symmetric about the x-axis, okay? And so we're just gonna find two times the area. And if we figure out what this angle is for theta, so I'm gonna call that like theta sub one or A in this case, and we figure out what this angle is B, then we should be good, all right? Now, um, clearly one of those is the pole or one of those is gonna be when theta equals zero, okay? So when theta equals zero, this means that we get R equals two cos of three times zero, or in other words, that's gonna be two cos of zero, which is two, all right? So that's actually right here when theta is equal to zero. So now we just need to figure out this point right here, and that's gonna be at the pole, okay? So this is when, when theta equals zero, R equals two, but we wanna know when R is equal to zero. Okay, so to figure that out, what we're going to do is we're just going to set the original function equal to zero and solve. Okay, so we're just going to have that zero equals two cos three theta. Or that just yields zero equals cos of three theta. All right, now we know that cos of theta is equal to zero when theta is equal to pi halves and three pi halves. All right, but in this case, we have three theta. Right? So we're just gonna let that be equal to three theta and then divide by two. So our theta, or divide by three, excuse me, and we're gonna say that theta is pi six and pi halves. Okay, so those are gonna be our two angles at which we reach the pole, okay? Um, now remember, we could trace this multiple times, okay? This is the first time it intersects the pole. And so what's happening, if we were to think of this as orientation, it's really going this way on the curve, okay? So right here, we're gonna start, and I'm gonna reverse these. And we're gonna say that our, our initial angle B is equal to zero, or A is equal to zero, excuse me. And then our terminal angle B is gonna be equal to pi six, okay? And so now we can set up an integral. And remember, we have to double that to be able to find the correct area. And so we're gonna say that the area is equal to two times the integral from zero to pi six. And remember our formula, okay? We go back up here, it's one half f of theta squared. So our f of theta is going to be two cos three theta. That's gonna be two cos three theta square d theta, okay? And now we're just gonna evaluate. Um, the two and the half are gonna cancel each other out. We're gonna square. And so our area is gonna be equal to the integral from zero to pi six. And we're gonna have four cos square three theta d theta, all right? Now, to evaluate this integral, we have to remember our techniques all the way back from the beginning of the course when we looked at the idea of being able to evaluate these sorts of trigonometric integrals. Um, one thing we remember is we remember the power reducing formula, okay? And we know that cos square of theta is equal to one half plus one half cos two theta, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna use that right here. And we can rewrite this as, I'm gonna factor the four out, integral from zero to pi six. And now we're gonna have one half plus one half cos, and we have to double this interior angle, which is gonna be six theta, okay? So notice in the formula, you just have to double whatever the angle is d theta. Okay. Now we can just integrate term by term. So we're going to get four times the quantity of antiderivative of one half in terms of theta is one half theta. We're going to use the reverse of the chain rule. 
And instead of multiplying by six, we're gonna divide by six. So this is gonna be one over two times six. And the antiderivative of cosine is sine six theta from zero to pi six. Now we're gonna substitute and I'm also gonna distribute the four through. And so this winds up being two times pi six plus one third sine of six times pi six minus two times zero plus one third sine six times zero. All right. So finally we compute two times zero is zero sine of zero, because this just becomes zero and sine of zero is zero. This becomes one third sine of pi. And we know that the sine of pi is zero as well. Okay, so we just take a look at our unit circle to evaluate this. And then finally, two times pi six just becomes pi thirds, okay? Um, and so if we wanted the entire area, Okay, so remember what this represents. This is just the area of one of these leaves. Okay, if we wanted all the area, and not that I asked for that, but all three of the leaves would be three times pi thirds, or that would be pi. Okay, um, if I just wanted half the leaf, okay, so we just have to use our symmetry to be able to figure out um, precisely what it is that we're trying to find. Okay, so that's an introduction to being able to find areas using polar coordinates. Again, deriving our formula from polar wedges, we end up with this area formula for our integrals or for our areas. And so one half integral a to b of f of theta squared d theta. And then we probably want to make sure that we remember our power reducing formulas because they're going to come up a lot um, as we go through and try to evaluate these integrals.